Hello, and welcome to the Climate Academy by Grounded. I'm Chad Frischman, Senior Director of Project Drawdown, and I'll be moderating our panel today. If you're not familiar, Grounded is a philanthropic organization that was created to identify and amplify climate solutions that harness nature and human ingenuity to ensure a livable planet. This organization is committed to bringing together the brightest minds and leading solutionists to foster greater collaboration, drive mass awareness, and scale nature-based solutions to urgently address the climate crisis and stay below a 1.5 degrees Celsius global temperature rise. Ground has launched the Climate Academy, which is a series of digital content and events like this paddled today. Over the next hour, we're going to have a great discussion about a very important topic, methane. What is it? Why is it so harmful to our planet? And what can be done about it? Grounded is committed to highlighting climate solutions. So we're going to start out by short showing, sharing a short film, Mitigating Methane, that features one solution to a massive problem. Then we're going to hear from an excellent lineup of scientists, environmentalists, and entrepreneurs who can share the data and the solutions we all need to understand. Following our panel, each of the panelists will, will be available for a virtual breakout room to answer any additional questions that you may have and connect directly with the speakers. So I encourage you to stick around for those. And finally, Grounded's online climate community is a great place to continue the conversation around this and other critical climate solutions. So be sure to join at grounded.org. But without further ado, please enjoy this short uh, sneak peek into mitigating methane. We have a climate crisis heading towards us. The reduction of methane is the single biggest opportunity to slow climate change right now. All global emissions, 14.5% is from livestock. And the majority of that is in the form of methane. We see that it's possible to reduce methane production from ruminants. Mutual allows farmers to deploy a natural product into their animals that can reduce methane by 40%. We saw the impact this may have on the planet Mutual is a movement, it's more than a product. Wow, wonderful. I'm really excited to see this film when it comes out. Uh, I think it's a great way to get us thinking about methane and one way to address it. I'm excited to introduce our panelists so we can expand this conversation and look at all the sources of and solutions that can help mitigate methane an incredibly potent greenhouse gas. Today, we've assembled a group of climate and methane experts, scientists, and solutionists who have dedicated their lives to addressing the climate crisis. In my work at Project Drawdown, we map, model, and describe the most substantive technologies and practices, real solutions that can be taken today to help us stop the greatest crisis humanity has ever faced, global warming. And methane plays an incredibly important part in that system of solutions. But I'm pleased to also uh, welcome our panelists here today who represent a diverse group of folks coming together around this very important subject. We have Christy Mosley, the CEO and founder of Full Harvest, Sarah Smith, Program Director at the Clean Air Task Force, Dr. Ermias Kabrib, Professor at the University of California, Davis, and Thomas Hafner, the CEO and founder of Mutral. So let's get started. Methane is a potent greenhouse gas, as we said, and a climate pollutant that traps heat in our atmosphere and contrib contributes to global temperature rise. It's far more potent than carbon dioxide. In equivalent to carbon dioxide, it's about 34 times uh, more potent at a 100-year time scale. But when we think about the 20-year impact of this great this heat-trapping gas, it could be 86 times more potent than carbon dioxide. So reducing human-caused sources of methane emissions could be one of the most critical climate solutions to maintaining a livable planet and avoiding tipping points. So I wanna turn first to, to Sarah. Sarah, can you speak about why methane matters from an air, climate, and, and quality perspective? Chad, it's wonderful to be here with this outstanding panel. And you're right, methane is incredibly potent greenhouse gas. The recent IPCC report trained a huge spotlight on methane as causing 
about half of the one degree Celsius of warming that the planet is currently experiencing. And this is so important because we're already seeing the effects of climate change today from inten more intense heat waves and wildfires to extreme weather events. And unfortunately, methane concentrations in the atmosphere are going up rapidly. Uh, the good news is that reining them in is possible with existing solutions, and doing so is the biggest lever we have to bend down the temperature curve, slow warming over the next several decades, which, which are critical decades when it comes to avoiding feedbacks and climate tipping points, and, which I know other panelists will expand on. Methane is also an ozone precursor. So reducing it brings a host of co-benefits for our health. The ozone formed from methane prematurely kills more than half a million people around the world every year. And rain, raining it in could also bring economic benefits from increased crop yields and putting people to work, reducing the pollution. Excellent. I, I, I want to turn to to Ermias. You are one of the front. You're on the front lines of climate research, and, and based on your current perspective and, and, and area of work, what are the immediate and long term impacts of methane emissions on our climate and human society? Why is methane so important? Yeah, it's great. Uh, I think, uh, as you already mentioned earlier, um, methane has uh, a much more impact. In, in the short term, when, com when compared to a other long period of time. So um, I think what we need to understand is that um, methane in the, in the atmosphere over a shorter period of time, the, the, the impact of it is, is, is much more. So that gives us actually an opportunity. So when you reduce it, you, you, you'll be able to get that gain uh, almost immediately because methane lives in the atmosphere for about a decade or so. And the, the, the recent IPCC um, a revision, the, the sixth revision actually uh, made that point by uh, assigning different sort of values for fossil fuel methane and for uh, for uh, biogenic methane that, that, that comes from, from livestock. So when, when you have from uh, fossil fuels, basically you're bringing up methane that was buried underground into the atmosphere, while for the livestock methane, it's, um, um, it, it's basically constantly recycled. So after 10 years, the methane in the atmosphere it breaks down into carbon dioxide and, and water, and then and goes the carbon dioxide goes back into the grass, and then you, you have that uh, cycle. So, I guess looking at just having a over a hundred year period that like like we do the, using the global warming potential for a hundred might not be the, uh, the the right way. So that there has been some uh, what's called the step plus equivalence has been proposed as an alternative means of comparing the emissions of uh, long and short lived greenhouse gases. So this type of equivalence is possible because. A single pulse of a single pulse emission of carbon dioxide and a sustained methane emission have a similar impact on a global mean temperature increases. So, if our if our objective is to to reduce the the, the global temperature increases, then we should be thinking differently about the long lived and short lived ones. So this approach, you know, you can th you can th think of the the equivalence by working backwards from the respective temperature. Outcome. So if an individual carbon dioxide emission has a certain impact on the global temperature, then is it possible to define equivalent methane emissions that would result in approximately the same impact? Um, so if, if we maintain the same amount of methane now, we, we don't have an increased impact on the global mean temperature. But, so that allows us then, if we start reducing now, then we will actually have this, this uh, cooling effect. So to be able to have no more emission uh, no more warming from methane. We should be. Uh, we need to reduce by 0 0.3 to 0 0.6 percent per year over the next 30 years. Then we will achieve that. No more warming from from methane. And so that's why it's really really important that if you, if you are able to reduce this by by this you know, relatively small amount, then we won't have any more uh, warming of the global warming from methane. Uh, and and so you know, looking at the sources of methane, it is possible to do that. So I, I have another question for you, uh, 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 Um So the IPCC also uh, publishes data on global warming potentials uh, in a uh, with feedback and without feedback, and in the hundred-year and twenty-year timescales. What's the difference between feedback 
with feedback and without feedback? And why are we not, you know, being really, you know, more conservative with the, with the atmosphere and focusing on the with impact and 20 year time scale of these potent gases? Why yeah, is the, it, uh, just using the other, the more conservative approach? Well, I think, um, I guess it, it, it depends on the uh, on the policy, and it, it was because of the policy that we are sticking with the with GWP 100. Because in the Paris Agreement, um, it was agreed that all countries would have to report their methane emissions from using the GWP 100. Mm -hmm. uh, as I mentioned earlier, it doesn't really make sense to have a GWP 100 for methane because it's short lived. It doesn't li it doesn't live in the atmosphere for 100 years. Um, uh, but then you know. Uh, the, the shorter impact, like the, the 20, the GWP 20, is probably the more appropriate in terms of its its impact. Um, and then using with all the the feedbacks when uh, in the climate, you know what happens within a short period of time when the methane is at, when, when the global warming is happening, and then that that warning will have a knock off a knock on effect on others, and then you have this uh, uh, negative feedback loop where things will continue, and they have the uh, sea rises uh, going, were going to happen, and, and th that will stimulate even even quicker um, changes in, in, in global temperature as well. So, I think the mm -hmm. GWT 100 is mostly for for accounting purposes. You know, for for the countries to agree. You know, this is what we're going to be doing. But hopefully, in, in the next couple of weeks, when COP 26 get together, uh, there will be a sort of a different way of of looking into this because. You know, methane is not really the same as carbon dioxide and, and nitrous oxide or uh, other gases. Uh, although the you know the biggest contributor is carbon dioxide, but I think in the short term we do have um, mm -hmm. a, a window to to uh, highlight in, uh, on on methane and, and be able to use that to try to even slow down global warming in the next decade or two. Well, I certainly hope it's a topic right in the front line of the discussions at COP26. Um, I'll be sure to bring it up myself when I'm over there. Uh, I want to turn to Thomas and, and, and Christine. Uh, can you please speak a little bit about your companies, uh, how your companies are working to reduce methane emissions and, and how these solutions can be scaled? Christine, go sure. first. Sure. Uh, well, at Full Harvest, we're really solving the massive food waste problem specifically at the farm level. And while li livestock is a massive issue um, and we absolutely need to solve all things uh, reducing methane, one of the most overlooked uh, areas of methane production is food waste um, and specifically at the farm level. And so uh, recent data has come out uh, with World Wildlife Fund and Tesco in the Driven to Waste report that confirms some of this. But um, this is all new just in the last year, year and a half or so, um, partially from Project Drawdown as well. But unbeknownst to a lot of people, food waste is actually based on emissions, the number one contributor to climate change. And not only that, but this new driven to waste report has shown when they looked globally at the whole supply chain, that more than half the problem actually comes from on-farm food loss, which previously a lot of focus was downstream with consumers. And again, we need to solve the entire food waste problem and all methane issues. But uh, we at Full Harvest are solving the on-farm food loss problem in a scalable way with a B2B marketplace to help farms sell their excess produce that is perfectly edible, but is going to waste simply because of imperfections or surplus reasons and connecting it to food and beverage companies, especially plant-based products that are ex escalating that don't need to care what produce looks like, all while digitizing the supply chain, which is stuck in the dark ages and data starved and has lack of transparency, which leads to even more waste. So really, this is something that um, a lot of people need to you know, start focusing on in terms of urgency and more solutions and being part of the forefront of the conversation. And in addition, um, you know, a lot of people don't understand why. And it's because food produces methane when it's decomposing, which is the most powerful emissions. And there's so much of it when we finally looked at the whole problem and started measuring it. Uh, it's that um, massive of an impact. Awesome. Thomas? Okay, we, we at Mutual, we are, we are after the emissions, the um, entric fermentation emissions from cattle. We, we have a long-term vision to address a number of other issues in terms of methane production, but our first goal is to drive down the production of methane from the fermentation process in cattle, which is 
according to the very recently launched Barclays report, is the single biggest source of methane production, even ahead of oil and gas at 27%. And um, bringing methane or keeping methane with, uh, production in check, as, as Eremios has said, is of course an important first step because then you're not at least not increasing it. But having a chance to actually substantially reducing one of the biggest sources of methane production will buy us a window to, for our carbon producing habits and our carbon sequestering technologies to kick in. Um, because the effect of that short-lived gas of 10 years coming down quite rapidly will, will, will reduce the amount of, of, of heat trapping gases in the atmosphere dr uh, dramatically very quickly, where CO2 stays in the atmosphere for hundreds of years. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's what we are basically addressing through a, a initially a feed supplement um, and we are working on multiple technologies to follow on from there to, to drive down the emissions from, from livestock, which are going to be with us for a long time um, because we need the protein that these cattle produce for us for a long time. In fact, it's still, pro still pro uh, projected to increase from one and, one and a half billion cattle to two and a half billion cattle by 2050 before it starts coming down again. So despite the fact of veganism, despite the fact of new alternative, alternative proteins coming to the market, the needs of a growing population and populations moving from cereal-based diets to, to um, um, protein-based diets will more than counterbalance that. So this is what we're addressing. We want, we want to drive that down substantially um, to buy the plan at the time. Um, and that has been shown that if we can drive that down by the 2040s, we can reduce by 0 0.3, 0 0.4 degrees um, um, the, 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 the global warming. Yeah. I mean, it seems pretty clear this is an all of the above uh, solution, right? We need uh, we need to be addressing food loss and waste across the supply chain, particularly at production where so much is lost. Uh, most food is lost at that point before it ever leaves the farm gate. Um, and we also need to think about what are some improved ways we can be feeding livestock, uh, improved livestock feed for sure, but also plant-rich diets. So reducing our overconsumption of meat, uh, which is ubiquitous at high-income countries, and maybe having a healthy diet, which is lower, lowering the amount of meat we assume or animal-based proteins we assume in the future to healthy levels across the planet. And that has a huge impact on emissions as well by lowering the methane from future projections of, of livestock um, and reducing some of that waste because a lot of waste across the supply chain happens to those animal-based products that we consume. So all across the supply chain, what, what Christine was talking about, I think as well, is so interesting is that when you think across the supply chain from production to distribution to processing and packaging, all of the uh, sectors that are involved in the food system produce so many emissions. That's why it's one of the most important. But what's really key is right at the right at the, before it ever leaves the farm gate. So I want to go back to uh, uh, Ermias and ask Ermias, you know, um, it, can you please talk a little bit about some of the agricultural solutions that we have available to us? Um, that you believe the greatest impact in terms of reducing methane emissions globally. Uh, and what do you consider to be the most important factors when we're thinking about, you know, the outcomes of methane emission solutions? Yeah, um, so I, I think the, the way that we can approach this uh, from an agricultural perspective, particularly from the livestock perspective, is uh, like a, a two-strong approach. So one is to try to improve productivity. So a lot of low-income countries um, uh, the, the, the level of productivity is very, very low. Um, here in the U.S. probably we, you're getting about 40, 50 uh, liters or kilograms of milk per day from one cow, while um, in other countries like in Ethiopia, for example, you have three, four liters um, of milk per day, per day from one cow. So you would like, you know, 10, over tenfold uh, the differences in, in productivity. And the methane that's being produced, yes, you know, the, the cow that's producing uh, 50 kilograms will have uh, more methane, but if you look at the per, per unit per kilogram of, of milk that, that we are producing, it's much, much lower. So um, the, there need to be a lot of efforts in bringing up the productivity. And that's, that's another thing that we have to think about is that most of the increases in livestock uh, numbers is, is going to be happening in low and middle income countries because the, the demand is going to be higher, but the anim if the animals are not productive enough, what do you do? You have to increase the number of animals. So mm -hmm. really Im improving the productivity of, of those animals, uh, which we, you know, we have done it here in, in OECD countries, 
uh, through uh, genetics, through nutrition, through management, and all these t t technologies and techniques we know very well. And so we, we need to help uh, low and medium income countries to achieve the, the same gains that we have achieved so that we reduce those, uh, those numbers. Like in, in the US, for example, over the last uh, the, the decades, and so the, the number of uh, animals are steadily decreasing. Even if the demand is going up, uh, or, or at least they have, uh, based on the population increases, you, you know you see that the, the lives of numbers are actually going down. So we need to be able to achieve that, and, and that's that's really the focus of uh, of, of uh, mitigating methane in, in low low income and mid income countries. In OECD countries, uh, the, I think the approach is probably a little bit different, where now we do have a, a lot of knowledge about how to. Uh, meet the requirements of the animals so that you know they, they, there has been a two percent per year increase in milk production for example and that seems to be continuing um, uh, in, in the next few years where you have better genetics and better uh, nutrition and all that uh, and so what we can do is then use some technologies to to reduce the, the methane emissions from each of the from each of the cow so I think uh, the, the uh, you see it on the video, and uh, and Thomas has uh, um, uh, mentioned that you know we have technologies such as such as Mutrol that reduces the, the, the emissions, and so we have a slew of different type of feed additives that are coming up at, at the moment. So that there are different level of uh, development, and 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 then you know some some will make it, some will not. But you know the, at least we have the the choice, and and it's not just a matter of having one or the other. I think it's it's a combination of having and also. Uh, different feed additives working in different ways can actually be combined to get even a, an even better um, uh, reduction potential. Right? So, for example, you know, have seaweed or S3 NLP that are in inhibitors, and then you have uh, Mutrol and, uh, uh, that, that would be modifying the, the rumen. If you combine those two, you actually achieve even a better um, reduction. So having those at our arsenal will be uh, an extremely powerful way of, uh, of reducing emissions in OECD countries in the next few years. And then, you know, once we address the, the, the low-income countries, the uh, improvement in, in productivity, those can be applied on top of that as well so that we can have a, a much lower uh, methane footprint uh, moving forward. Thank you. I mean, one, one question, I, additional question I have for you, uh, Ramias, is, you know, what about regenerative agricultural practices? Are you familiar with these practices that allow uh, improved yield, uh, increasing yield, and actually can help reduce losses on the farm? Can you speak a bit about um, some other forms outside of livestock and, you know, uh, in crop production and, and other ways that are more regenerative in nature? Yeah, so I mean, um, I'm, I'm, my, my background is mostly on livestock, but uh... I was actually uh, quite pleased to see the, the, those kind of uh, regenerative agriculture ha having a lot of uh, advantages because the the, the biggest uh, sink of carbon is the soil. Uh, actually, soil has has more carbon than soil uh, in in the atmosphere and in plants combined, and so we have this huge opportunity to put carbon into the soil and regenerative agriculture. That's what's helping us to, to do that. Uh, last week, I was actually in Scotland, in northern Scotland, in the Orkney Islands, and I was I was talking to for, to, to farmers where basically what they were doing is you know, the, uh, you know, more or less carbon farming. So they do have this this ranches where it's a, perm it's a permanent grass, so it's, it's permanently drawn in carbon. And when they measure the soil or the soil organic carbon uh, year on year, you see the, the increases the number of soil organic carbon going on from that uh, from that ranch. And, and together with you know, two wind turbines, you know, one wind turbine uh, was enough to, to uh, meet all the energy demands for the farm. Uh, this is in, in Scotland, so it's very windy. <laughs> so they have a lot of electricity from that. And the second wind, uh, wind turbine goes directly to the, to, uh, to the grid. So they're actually supplying electricity to the, to the city as well as making sure that their, their farm is also um, completely covered. And then you have the carbon that's coming in and, and, and being uh, into, the, into the ground. And they practice uh, what's called that the mob, mob grazing. So basically mimicking nature. Um, you know, and and um, in, in, in the US, you know, 100, 200 years ago, that's what it used to be. You have bisons coming in, basically grazing 
uh, the, the grasslands and, and then coming back again. So it's basically a, a, huge, uh, a lot of animals together and, and grazing that, that's going to stimulate the grass and grow. So they, they, they're doing exactly the same thing uh, in a lot of places as well. So they basically bring all the cows in, in a certain area and then they move them sometimes once, sometimes twice a day so that you have the, this, this grazing going on and then, up and, and then probably a week or two weeks later, they come back to the same spot. And you see, you generate a lot of carbon, uh, stimulate the, the growing of grass, mm -hmm. and that yeah. carbon, a lot of the carbon going down in, in, into the, that. So I think, yeah, through regenerative agriculture like that, you should be able to increase the number of carbon in the soil. So you draw in carbon to the soil. That's, again, this is a, all of the above we're a system that we need to be thinking about, right? We need all solutions at the table that we know work that have this kind of impact. Um, and I love that we can think systemically, think in an integrated way where we're stacking functions on different types of solutions to combine to get more productive. Uh, but that requires new design, new designing, new thinking, and probably really important policy, right? Policy is an incredibly important lever throughout everything we're talking about today, whether it's livestock, feed supplements or subsidies going there, or we're talking about food waste and loss or, or agricultural practices across the board of how we can reduce methane. And probably really importantly as well, are those methane leaks coming from the natural gas and uh, gener for generation of uh, electricity. So, but I want to turn to Sarah because you, you're really at the, the, the front lines here. Can you, can you speak to the state of methane policy making globally uh, and the soon to be launched uh, global methane pledge? Uh, what are some of the opportunities that exist to to motivate greater commitments to methane reductions at a, at a large scale? What are the lessons that we can bring to uh, COP26 when we when we head over there? Policymakers are starting to pay attention, Chad, and you're absolutely right. I agree. We need the multi-pronged approach, all of the above, every solution that we know works for methane. And... At COP26, methane is poised to be squarely on the agenda, thanks to this landmark global methane pledge being co-led by the US and the European Union. Already more than 33 countries have joined, committing to work toward a global economy-wide reduction of methane, 30% by 2030, along with a commitment to pursue all available measures domestically to rein in methane emissions. So importantly, we're looking at, at all sources and importantly, we're looking at fast action, right? 2030, mm -hmm. because as other speakers have mentioned, methane is, is a short-lived gas and this is the critical window to reduce it to rein in temperature rise and help avoid feedbacks and tipping points. So I am, I am hopeful that, <laughs> that we're going to see a lot more policy momentum over the next few years. In fact, just this month, we're expecting the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency to propose rules to reduce methane pollution from the oil and gas industry here. Mm -hmm. The European Union is moving forward with their methane strategy, which is multi-sectoral, and we expect some legislation specifically around oil and gas industry venting and flaring leaks and monitoring to be released in December of this year. Mm -hmm. And many other countries around the world are, are taking, uh, taking this on from Nigeria, looking at reducing their flaring and writing new methane rules to Colombia, Ecuador, uh, many, many countries actively working on this. China even in the country's latest five-year plan uh, wrote about efforts to address methane domestically. And then of course we have, we have trade policy that will likely have major implications for both agriculture and the oil and gas sector helping to rein in emissions. And satellite technology is, is on the horizon, which will for really the first time, give us a much better look at where the pollution is coming from around the world and much more real time assessments of some of these large plumes that have mm -hmm. flown under the radar for a long time. All right, so you're, you're hopeful for COP. You're hopeful for this COP26, something big to happen around that thing. Yes, the, the pledge will formally launch, and I'm hopeful that many more countries will join in addition to the 33 that already have, including several major 
emitters. And of course, philanthropy has, has announced a fund to help implement this pledge. And many financial institutions, including the World Bank, are working on ensuring that capital will be available to help developing countries achieve their methane emissions reduction goals. Excellent. I'm really excited to, to see this. And I'll be at COP. I'll come stop by and say hello. Um, so, you know, I'm also really excited to note that at Project Rodan, we're about to release a whole new set of results, a whole bunch of new solutions, and that includes uh, several dedicated solely to avoided methane, which includes livestock feed supplements, includes cattle manure management, and uh, 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 methane leak management across the board. So there's going to be a whole new sector uh, of, of solutions that we're adding to the drawdown list. Um, it, it, part of the system of solutions kind of came out later. And of course, we have the uh, solutions around, uh, you know, methane capture and using electricity generation. And of course, the ever essential solution, reduce food loss and waste across the system. This is really big. Um, so so we're really excited as well for Project Drawdown to be a part of this discussion. It's so important that we address these um these important solutions. And I want to turn it first, though, back to Christine because of that all important solution, reduce food loss and waste. You know, Full Harvest is working to solve that as best they can at the farm level in the supply chain. Is that, that's essential, right? Because so much is lost before food ever leaves the farm gate. What are other methane mitigation solutions that exist that complement the work being done by Full Harvest? At the farm level? at the farm level, particularly, you know, something that complements that or even beyond the farm level. Yeah, I think um, what, you know, we right now, for better, for worse, are, you know, one of the only solutions really helping farmers to sell more of what they produce. Today, we already grow enough to feed 9, 10 billion people. And as um, Ramayas was saying, you know, it's a production issue as well, where, you know, he was talking about livestock, but at the farm level, there's been a lot of talk around how do we improve production or make it more efficient, yet we're wasting sometimes up to 30, 40% of what we produce at the farm level, uh, specifically produce uh, over a quarter of everything that's edible that's grown globally is wasted on farm. And that's what we're hyper-focused on. And so, you know, beyond just us helping to increase sales and selling of that produ produce instead of it going to waste. We have seen a lot within, you know, the regenerative ag space on the soil side at the farm level, which, you know, it's really exciting to see a lot of traction and discussions around that. Um, you know, I think I'd like to see those conversations be a little bit more tied to the food waste conversation because they seem a little bit bifurcated. And sometimes that can, um, you know, there can be more synergies if there's more, you know, collaboration and efforts joining together on that. Uh, and then downstream on the food waste system, um, there are, you know, several really amazing uh, tech startups helping to bring data and a similar, but to different parts of the supply chain, productivity and efficiency in terms of selling more uh, and uh, better forecasting and transparency and efficiencies. And, you know, there are things like Too Good To Go, which is helping restaurants um, sell some of their product that would have gone to waste to consumers. Uh, there are uh, companies that are helping with efficiencies of retailers being able to buy and purchase more efficiently and effectively so that more doesn't go to waste. Um, and, you know, it's really exciting to see that uh, innovation and acceleration happening. I do feel like there was a lot that happened around the same time Full Harvest was created four or five years ago. And those have become like some of the big players. And since then, uh, you know, haven't seen as many tech solutions come out since then on the food waste solution. And so there's still so much opportunity there. So just, you know, encourage, uh, you know, the ecosystem to still push the envelope and look for more creative solutions on that. Um, and, you know, the consumer side as well, uh, you know, the imperfect foods or misfit markets have been helping consumers purchase, you know, product that would have gone to waste as well, which, you know, really pulls the, um, the, the product. But the, the most exciting trend that we've seen, which we are um, helping big brands market and cater towards is 
that, you know, a lot of people in the food industry really believe that the next organic trend is going to be, and it already is starting to be this upcycled rescued trend where consumers are looking for products with more sustainable supply chains and products in them. And so uh, we help big brands like Mondelez and Danone actually create sustainable, scalable supply chains of verified rescued produce that would have gone to waste otherwise and then market against that. And now they're marketing that and it's some of their top sellers in terms of SKUs, which has been really amazing to see. And really, um, I think it's just the tip of the iceberg of this pull from consumers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think it's fantastic the work that that, that you're doing at Full Harvest and, and many of these other companies. You recently wrote an article uh, just highlighting some of the great work that's also being done across mm -hmm. the space from, from, from folks. And it's so important because often we think about reduced food loss and waste. We think about just the end of the supply chain, right? We think about what we're doing as consumers at the end. We don't think about all the emissions, energy that go through. This is even get it to our homes before we throw it away. Right. There's so much that's being lost there. Right. And uh, it's so important to think we don't want to, uh, uh, you know, figure out how to use the waste at the end. I mean, composting is an important solution for waste management, as is landfill methane capture. But we need to prevent that waste from happening to start with while we're still feeding the world's population. And that, I want to get to that point, too, because a lot of the discussion has been around you know, agriculture and uh, food loss and waste. But one of the uh, main solutions, one of the, one of the top solutions, one of the top five solutions of Project Drawdown that we've been putting out there for many years now is a plant-rich diet. The test does have an effect when you reduce the amount of overconsumption of everything to a healthy level, has an effect of reducing food loss and waste across the system as well, because it sends ripples down the entire supply chain. Um, but it also, we talk about, you know, uh, reducing the amount of animal-based proteins. And I want to get back to, to Thomas and uh, uh, Hermias to talk a little bit more about the trends that we're seeing in the future expectations of increased animal-based uh, consumption of animal-based proteins. And, you know, we talked to Thomas, you mentioned a bit about, you know, uh, alternatives to this and other needs and protein needs. Um, how, wh why are we expecting that the world needs to have this massive transformation because currently we actually aren't consuming globally. We have a pretty healthy diet overall on global levels, but we need to increase the protein uptake and nutrient levels in uh, least and less developed countries uh, to, to healthy levels. And a lot of people assume that means you have to, you know, consume a lot, a lot more meat. Why is that the case? Why is it the assumption? And, and, you know, tell me a little bit more about Hermias and Thomas, but why we're thinking about, uh, livestock uh, uh, as being such an important uh, solution uh, in this space? Well, um, if I may, Emirates, er um, um, share, share my thinking on that. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, we not only will still see population growth from the current 8 billion to about 10 billion by the time we reach 2050, but we also see um, large swathes of population in developing countries moving from cereal-based diets to protein-based diets. And there is, at this moment in time, um, from a variety of angles, from a cultural perspective, from an economic perspective, from a scalability perspective, there is still seen that the animal is going to be the provider of that protein. Um, and um, that's not going to be, we're not going to get that out of people anytime soon. Um, the sooner we do, the better for the planet. Um, but until such time, we need to make sure that we help those animals um, being more be more sustainable, um, and that's 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 the business we're in. And and what we our mission is to yes, we have some low hanging fruits or some early targets, like I mentioned earlier. What we what is our first technology, but also looking at having and Hermes uh, mentioned that in terms of gen gen genetic in, um, 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 uh, working, having um, more having more protein from less animals. And that comes from having healthier animals from a more healthy gene pool um, with animals that are, as, as, we, as we have already shown in the West, um, in the developed countries, um, have shown that we are capable of taking um, a, a, a dairy cow from producing uh, three and a half, four thousand uh, kilos of, uh, of, of milk in 1960s to 10,000 kilograms of milk in, in, where, where we are today in the United States. Um, we need to be teaching folks to be doing that in, 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 in the developing world 
um, to 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 drive down that intensity. Um, um, so, coming back to, to to your question, why do we need those animals? Because it's just a very efficient and and relatively low cost way of turning forage and other things into protein. Um, and and that we, we, until those new technologies have uh, become scalable, become affordable, become culturally acceptable, and we've changed people's habits. That's probably the hardest thing to change people's habits. Um, we're still going to need those animals, and that's 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 why we're working on that. But um, and there are a multitude of things that we can we can work on, and one of them is the we talked about this the supplementation of driving down that methane production. Um, increasingly so through mm -hmm. through a multi pronged approach. Um, uh, there is um, 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 producing healthier animals, breeding healthier animals that produce more, um, bringing feeds to the animals that, and we're working on, on something that um, delivers a healthy plant based protein that in itself, in its production, is already carbon sequestering. So um, there are lots of incremental ways there's some early early um uh, wins to be had and then it's a matter of of mm -hmm. bit by bit by bit by bit um to do that to buy ourselves the time to change our habits yeah um and to 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 bring it all back into an equilibrium that we have lost um yeah. i think that's that's really what 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 a roadmap for a company like us has to be um just to make a supplement to reduce methane to make a ton of money it, that would be that would be a shame. Yeah, we need to have a much larger vision here as a as a as a community. Um, and if I may, if you give me the, the a couple of more minutes, having technologies is one thing. Who's going to pay for them is another, and that has been at Mutual has been the, the single biggest um, um, issue that we have faced over these past years. We were working on tech on technology and a technology that there was no obvious payer for. Farmer wasn't incentivized to be to be paying for for reducing its, its their impact, um, and that's where things like carbon credits, for example, the, the emission emission trading comes in, hmm. and that's where global warming potential, that's where the proper recognition of methane comes in. So, in the absence of legislation that mandates a reduction of methane by X percent by whatever means of technologies that are out there, we're gonna have we're gonna have to find ways to align all stakeholders. To make sure this this gets deployed, yeah. yeah, and that's where we, as the world's first company, we have we have issued carbon credits from this type of reduction, and have sold them at a significant premium to polluters who were happy to contribute to the adoption of of a technology that can make such a big impact. Um, changing, and, and we do hope we have great hopes at COP26 that methane now finally gets recognised for its. Yes, there is this argument that it's it's short-lived so hey what we're we even talking about but that's one thing but the other side of the flip side of the story is if we reduce this fast and we can incentivize folks to to drive adoption of technologies that reduce methane fast and 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 and, and, and the carbon credit or even if we have a methane credit down the line is a fantastic tool to to drive that um and that's what we're going to be driving for and uh, gwp 100 Sorry, it doesn't work. GWP twenty is even twice as long as methane lives. Yeah, um, so that needs to be there needs to be some kind of incentive to 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 drive up to tweak those wheels, which costs nothing to governments, to help companies to de to deploy these technologies and align other stakeholders helping them to deploy that by by paying for that, so that farmers who could ill afford that kind of stuff um, or those kind of solutions are not only not under more pressure financially, but actually we can we can help them even make more money by 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 deploying this and incentivizing them and improving their very stressed financial uh, position. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the, lots of good points there, and of course, you know, behavior change is hard. It's really hard to do changing those habits, and we may actually think about how we can avoid changing current habits to bad habits of the future. Right. So we're not over consuming meat products. We're not over consuming all products and then wasting so much along the way. How do we avoid the future bad habits by not changing behavior as it currently is uh, and, and maybe changing behavior in high income countries 
that's the big challenge. How do we do that? That's really hard. And I think uh, Armias has some good points here about how do we make animal-based uh, uh, livestock more productive so we have less livestock that are, we need to feed a healthy diet of the future. Uh, again, avoiding those bad habits, but a healthy diet of the future may have producing better yield, better productivity from those from those uh, from those animals. But I also I want to hear from Armias, but I also want to bring Sarah a little bit into the conversation as well because you also mentioned a lot about policy and incentive incentives. And I think you're absolutely right. How do we how do we think about carbon markets? Could be an option. We could also think about subsidies. Like, you know, how are we if we evaluate the true cost of meat? Is that going to send price signals? And we switch our subsidies from supporting meat industry and livestock industries to supporting some of these alternatives like better producing, uh, uh, you know, higher productivity uh, meat products or uh, alternatives, we may actually see that kind of shift. So I want to talk first with Armias and then to Sarah. And Armias, can you talk a little bit about, uh, a little bit more about the, uh, the same topic with Thomas, but, you know, how we see those future trends. And then Sarah, a little bit about uh, alternative policy mechanisms that we may in front of us. Right, sure. So I think uh, going back to the uh, question you first uh, raised on in terms of uh, animal source food vis-a-vis -vis the nutrition and do, do, we, do, we, do we need that, how we, how we can reduce consumption. Um, coming from a, uh, a low-income low country, you know, uh, maybe much lower on the table and on, on that table, on that uh, ranking, um, I, I've seen it firsthand that uh, the, the amount of Animal sources available is not that much. Um, growing up, we, we probably have meats, you know, during holidays, you know, Christmas, New Year, and stuff like that. It's it's something on special occasions. Most of the, the other time, you're, ha you're having plant-based uh, food, and you know, some of the impacts of that is uh, about 30 to 60 percent of, of children under five years of age are stunted, and and stunting is really horrible disease because they they will never get to they, are, they, they will never meet their full potential. And, and so why is that? Because there's no enough um, nutrients that, that, that they're consuming from, from mm -hmm. uh, the, the plant-based ones, while animal source food will give you all of the nutrients that you need because you know, the amino acid profile is perfect for, for humans, uh, particularly like eggs and, uh, and, and others. They have uh, minerals that you can easily absorb. So. I think when we talk about reducing animal source food consumption, we really have to realize where we are we doing that. I mean, in low-income uh, countries, we actually need to increase it because mm -hmm. we have huge amount of uh, lower amount of uh, uh, consumption and uh, has a huge health health impact. Uh, but you know, in uh, in high-income countries, then yeah, there is a, a case to be made. Um, uh, one of the groups, for example, between the age of 19 to 50, old men. Uh, the group where they are over consuming meat so i think we can definitely work on that to try to reduce it but in other segments of society particularly women between the age of uh, uh, 12 to, to to 21 they are actually consuming less than they but when they are when their need for iron for example is quite high they are not consuming that in the uk they are seeing some diseases that's been uh, long eradicated coming back so i think we have to be very very nuanced in in what it is but um, definitely increasing the, the, the plant-based diets, I think is uh, very much welcome and having alternatives for plant-based alternatives that that's welcome. I think, uh, as you said, Chad earlier, it's, it's a combination of everything. I think there's a lot of nuanced, uh, discussion that, that, that we, we can have. It's not like animal source food are bad. We can completely ban it and just go to Absolutely. vegan. I mean, it, uh, there's no one uh, silver bullet for this kind of uh, solutions. It has to be context. It, it depends on the context. Absolutely. You know, a project around a plant-rich diet is not vegan or vegetarian. It's definitely a mix. It's all of the above, right? Except for overconsumption. That's what we kind of try to avoid. Yep. But I want a quick, uh, Sarah, if we get a little bit about the policy, and then I have a wrap-up question uh, for, uh, for, for the whole crew. So, Sarah, can you just jump in a little bit about the policy alternatives? I appreciated that that answer from us. And I think that we have to be pragmatic about the fact that overall, we need to act, probably increase and will increase consumption of, of animal-based food in, in much of the world um, as people hopefully become wealthier and more better able to access good nutrition. So as a result, we need all the solutions on the table to help improve the health of animals um, 
and, and all of the other solutions discussed. I think that it will be important to, as policy moves forward, ensure that financing is available to help developing countries um, meet their emissions reductions goals while also improving access to, to good nutrition. And another priority needs to be well studying all of the solutions that are on the table um, to ensure that we have the long term full life cycle studies to ensure that they are excellent solutions. Thank you, Sarah. All right, so I have one more question for the whole crew. I want everyone to take about you know, more than 20 seconds to answer because we're running out of time. But um, yeah, what action, so we, we, there's a lot of talk, particularly when you're going to cough, there's talk, talk, talk. We're all about talking about the problem, talking about solutions, but what, can, what actions can people take today to mitigate methane? How, what, what can we take from people, people watching, take from this panel and, and, and go out and just and do something? What can they do? I'll start with uh, Christine. Um. I'll just list off a few that I say all the time, buy imperfect produce or products with that, um, buy whole products, because if you buy any byproduct like a Remain Heart or a Celery Heart, it's actually reducing 50 to 65%, or it's um, wasting 65 to 50% of the product on farm. Um, compost, compost, compost. And a really successful thing I learned during COVID is organize your fridge with the top shelf being things that are about to go bad and always try to eat from that first. It reduced my in-home food waste by 90%. So little things like that can really, really make a big difference as a consumer. Thank you. Thomas. I think it's quite simple. Demand methane reduced produce. Um, as it is available, it is possible to do that. We have already proven it. You can already in London coffee shops, you can already buy methane reduced milk and it's replaced ordinary, ordinary milk within three weeks at a significant premium. People are willing to pay for this. This stuff works. You can just have to ask for it and people will, will supply what you're asking for. Thank you. Let me ask. Uh, well, um, I think well, one of the things, if you're if talking about methane, one, one of the things that completely uh, will have a, a very quick result is to, to stop methane from oil and gas. And that all the technology is available, but we need to push the oil, oil companies. And I was very pleased to see the CEO of, of Shell last week being challenged on, on that. There is no reason there's methane emission from oil, oil and gas anymore. There is technology, it's just, it's just investment and funding from those companies. So I think we need to, to, have to be active in, in uh, making sure that you know, those companies take, uh, to take that step. Uh, but I mean, that would really, really help. But individually, yeah. you know, what I try to do is you know, uh, not, not, not possible everywhere, uh, particularly if you have a lot of sun, like uh, a solar panel is, is uh, what, you know, I have a solar panel in my, my home and I drive a, a fully 100% electric car. So trying to do that and I'll also limit, you know, I'll have, uh, uh, reduced intake of, of alma source food from you know uh, a few years back but still make sure that you know i ha i have enough to, to, to be, be healthy i'm so glad that you mentioned uh the methane from natural gas it's 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 a it's a no-brainer it's pretty easy to do it's cost effective they could do it tomorrow it's yeah. just just need that policy to make that change or that incentive yeah. sarah I'll, I'll wrap up with you yes great suggestions and speaking of policy and speaking of the system systems we need to change to rein in methane, I would say, speak up, get loud, talk to the people who represent you in government and can force these oil and gas companies and write these trade policies and write these domestic standards to reduce methane quickly. Well, thank you all. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, Hermias. And thank you, Sarah, for participating in today's uh, Grounded Academy uh, uh, panel. We learned so much today. It was really great discussion. There's so many solutions at the table and this, to address an incredibly important uh, challenge that we're facing, but it's really great to hear the number of solutions that are available to us today to start taking action. So I'd like to thank you all and thank everybody who's been participating today, but it's not over. Uh, right now, we're gonna move on to some breakout rooms of your choice using the sidebar navigation uh, for an interactive Q&A with some of these panelists. I also want to make sure that uh, before you go, 
uh, go to grounded.org and join the Grounded Climate Community, where you're going to be able to learn more about uh, climate solutions and, and how to take action. Um, so thank you all for joining. And again, please join the Climate Academy at Grounded next month for a new climate solution. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.